save a little uh, movie time here. This is a um, OEM's movie from about manufacturing uh, thin film composite membranes. The technology is all very, very similar. There's some nuances to it if you really want to get down in the weeds, but this is how it's done. But pay close attention to the surface material that they're going to demonstrate here. And this, this informs us why we have ranges in this technology for rejection and removal of contaminants. So um, let's go back here. To create our standard spiral wound membranes, we construct the flat sheet membrane using hydronautics automated casting equipment. We begin the process with a fabric support base and then coat it with a microporous polysulfone layer. This provides additional support for the top two micron thick membrane barrier layer. This top barrier layer makes the actual separation to purify the water. The semi permeable polyamide layer consists of a thin film of polymeric material, a few thousand angstroms thick, formed on porous supporting material. The semi permeable membrane skin is formed on the polysulfone substrate by interfacial polymerization of monomers containing amine and carbon. Okay, it's important to note this is actually the surface that is doing the molecular filtration that an RO membrane undertakes. Notice that there is different size pore structures in this material, and this determines the characteristics of the membrane, what it will reject, what it will reject well, what it will reject poorly. So understanding how this stuff is manufactured lets us know why these ranges take place. Hydronautics manufacturing procedure enables the optimization of distinct properties of the membrane support and salt rejecting skin. Combination of these three layers makes a durable membrane flat sheet produced from each spiral wound element. The membrane flat sheet is then combined with a sheet of feed channel spacer. This provides turbulence and creates space between the membrane sheets to allow uniform flow of the water to the entire membrane surface. The leaves of membrane with a channel spacer are combined with a sheet of permeate spacer, which provides an open flow channels with the permeate and even at the high pressure. The leaves are glued along each of the three exposed sides. And then rolled around the cold tube. With the back of the membrane completely sealed to the edges of the permeate spacer, the feed water is forced through the feed channel spacer, contacting the front or barrier layer of the membrane. Clean water, or permeate, passes through the membrane surface into the permeate channel and then flows in a spiral direction to the center of the element and is collected into the cold tube. Hydronautic spiral wound elements can then be loaded into pressure vessels, which are connected with additional elements to complete any number of design specifications. Once the end adapter is connected to the last element and the pressure vessel is sealed, feed water can be introduced and then treated. The feed water that does not permeate through the membrane becomes enriched in salts as it travels through the feed channel spacer due to permeate water being removed. Typically, 8 to 10 percent of the water is removed or the 40 strong membrane element. The permeate water then flows out the end of the vessel. It's collected as the product. And the rejects are concentrated from that vessel. They then flow through another vessel, producing more permeate. The remaining concentrate may then be disposed of as waste or possibly recycled as a feed. Typically, 70 to 90 percent of the water as pure product water. So that is essentially how uh, all thin film composite membranes are made. Uh, 
And that first layer that we saw with the structure where you saw the water going through and molecules being rejected, that's the layer that we need carbon filtration to protect from chlorine attack. That's the reason why we have carbon filters in front of every thin film composite membrane is to protect that layer from damage and opening up more holes and pore structures there to allow bypass. So when it comes to ROs, there are um, essentially two categories. High efficiency, where you're achieving um, much greater removal of purified water from the source water versus standard reverse osmosis. Typical high efficiency RO systems have a high pressure inlet to the, to the membrane. So they've got a pump increasing boosting pressure incoming to the membrane. Because RO systems all function on differential pressure. They all require a large delta uh, P across that membrane, a change in pressure. So the higher the pressure coming into the unit, the better production out of it. Um, they have a settable rejection rate so they can fine tune for water quality to make sure they're getting that uh, reject rate that they want and the life out of the membrane. Uh, you can get up to about 80% efficient with uh, high efficiency RO systems, but hardness following is a problem with high efficiency ROs as uh, you're probably going to need a, a water softener in front of one. Now, standard efficiency ROs, they may uh, typically function on inlet line pressure only. They may have a possible inlet pump, but what they don't have is a secondary pump or uh, a way to remove back pressure off the membrane from a tank. Uh, they work on a lower differential pressure, which means their production rates aren't as high. Um, they may work well on hard water, but they have high reject rates, which means um, a good standard efficiency RO is working at 25% efficiency. So that means for, one every, for every one gallon of water you make, you're throwing away four. And some um, lower quality RO membranes on the market, it's 10 to 1, throwing 10 gallons away for every one you make. So water costs, you know, in selecting this uh, technology do play a factor. Uh, high waste volume with these, and they're subject to variations in incoming uh, water pressure for production. If pressure isn't consistent, if you're getting pressure drops in buildings uh, prior to whole house RO or a large point of use RO system in a commercial application, you need to manage pressure drop and um, volume demand during peak operations. That quite often requires a boost pump. Um, it's, you know, it's possible, uh, and we've seen it in, in smaller commercial ROs where just because an establishment is busy, they lose enough water pressure that the RO really just become it really just isn't capable to keep up with the water demand that it was specified to. So what does a, uh, an RO membrane actually remove? Um, a thin film composite membrane, this is stats from, from Dow themselves, but the materials are pretty much analogous across companies. So get in the weeds on their spec sheets and things like that to understand the differences. Um, but notice that there is a reject range on all of these compounds, okay? And why do you think we have this range? Well, it's related to temperature. As the water gets colder, that material in that video that we, we saw, that shrinks. Those molecular bonds become tighter and the pore structure shrinks. So we get higher rejection rates at colder temperatures. As waters warm up, that fabric loosens and we allow more material through. Now, things that have lower rejection rates like boron and borate, these, these compounds 
at very similar size to water itself. They're slightly bigger. That's why they're making it through. Um, another thing that happens here, if you notice, bacteria is rated at 99 plus. Well, the reason why a lot of membranes are not rated for bacterial control is because you have no control over change out of a membrane, the liability issue. So a lot of, a lot of companies aren't going to certify their RO membranes for bacteria control because it requires proper sanitization of tanks and lines downstream. Uh, the waters get kind of muddy there. So if you are dealing with any of these, you know, low rejected, you know, compounds in your systems, please reach out to us. We can help you size a system that's appropriate for it. But just understand there are certain compounds out there that if they're similar in size to water, they're they're going to make it through. Now, that was the basically the ionic contaminants in the water. Basically, your dissolved solids, your TDFs in the water. Now, what does it come down to the things that are non-ionic? The organic in the water, the bacteria in the sieves. Notice that that stuff, turbidity, everything is greater than 99% on RO membranes. Why? Because this stuff is far larger than water. This is like trying to, you know, fit a um, a semi truck through your uh, garage, you know, you park in a semi truck in your garage. Home. It's just not going to fit. But you have organic molecules under the weight of 3,500. Why is this zero to 99%? That's one of those really odd things. So, depending on what organic molecules you have, some of them may be um, assembled in a straight chain, straight, sort of like a ladder. Um, you can carry a ladder through a doorway if you turn it and point the end of the ladder through the doorway. But if you carry it sideways, the length of the ladder hits the door jams. That's what's going on here with organic molecules. Some of them, uh, because of their shape, and if they're rotating in space, like everything does in water, may line up and go through that membrane end on like that ladder rather than sideways. That's why you get this zero to 99%. And this is also another reason why we have uh, activated carbon filters in front of RO membranes. It helps manage this issue with organic molecules. We're gonna adsorb that material before it ever makes it to the membrane. Plus, this is where you get your oils and greases and things like that, our organic compounds that will coat and follow a membrane as well, depending on your incoming water supply. So another reason why we have activated carbon in front of an RO system. Now, why do we use softening or pretreatment with high efficiency ROs or high volume RO systems? It's to protect the membrane. It's the concentration of mineral content in the RO membrane itself. Um, we have 80% efficient ROs on our commercial side of the business. And this illustrates what happens when you're trying to get that um, efficiency, high water efficiency out of an RO system. As we go down this can and as we remove water from it and concentrate mineral content, the LSI, LSI is the propensity of water to form scale. And at from top to bottom, we're increasing the concentration of salts in an 80% recovery mode to um, five times the amount of mineral content. So if you had 10 grain per gallon hard water going in, you have 50 grain per gallon water, uh, per grain per gallon water coming out. Now at 25 grains per gallon, that becomes 125 grain per gallon hard water. That's gonna form liquid rock very, very quickly. It's gonna follow a membrane very, very in very, very short term. And you're gonna lose that water efficiency and lose that membrane. 
That's the reason we use water softeners in front of high efficiency RO systems that are managing water for TDS. So you're able to extract that water. Now, if you are dealing with uh, residential drinking water with extremely high TDS, understand that your drinking water RO system is going to be affected by that and that a pump may be required or you may want to feed that membrane soft water um, just so that it has a better lifespan. And if you want some minerals, either install a blend around that RO or install a small little calcite feeder after that RO system for remineralization for taste. So understand when we're removing that, that water from the raw water and concentrating the waste, we're concentrating those minerals. That's why we need to inspect drain lines uh, on high efficiency RO systems so that they're not scaling up as well. So that's a nice refresher of RO technology. Realize that RO will reject just about everything in the water in a 90% range of reduction, um, even though it's not rated for. Um, I give away drinking water ROs for Christmas uh, just because I see a lot of municipal water reports. Um, but you realize it's going to do the job if it's maintained properly in most aspects, but understand that certifications are important for validating whether the performance of a product actually does what it says it does. But this is the raw sort of information on the technology. Now, um, something we are launching this year in our training department is you are now able to request training on demand for your business. Um, and that can be accomplished by emailing training.request at pentair.com. Um, when travel restrictions are lifted, we'll be doing in-person product training and troubleshooting training, uh, water quality training, issues both raw and uh, desired, uh, basics of water treatment, opportunity training around uh, water treatment, valves, controls, uh, drop-in filter cartridges, reverse osmosis systems, or if you just want to talk shop about a job and, and bounce ideas uh, back and forth, we can set up time for that as well, because there's lots of ways to skin the cat in water treatment. Or if you just want to set some time for some feedback on product to us technical trainers, we're happy to be in here to uh, uh, gather the issues that you're having and, and hopefully help uh, speed a resolution to a technical issue you may be having. If it comes to like billing and stuff like that, man, that's not our purview. But if you got technical issues, let us know. Be happy to help out uh, any way we can. Now, are there any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question uh, or use the chat feature. If not, I'll give you back the balance of your morning. Are there any questions? Yes. Hi, I have a question. Um, my name is Gary, and I'm, I'm wondering, can we get this PowerPoint emailed to us? Um, we will be recording this and putting this on our, our Big Ten can for use. Okay. So it'll be accessible? Yes, it will. Okay. And my second question is, can I get on your Christmas gift list? <laughs> Maybe. Um, I'll, I'll be talking to your salesperson. All righty. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending. Have a wonderful day.